Hello everyone, welcome to this course on structural dynamics. So today our uh, first lecture we will uh, talk about Newton's law and uh, D. Alembert's principle and we will see how we can further use this principle to develop the equation of motion for a structure that we are going to solve in this course. Now uh, you all know uh, Newton's law and if you recall <coughs> there are three different laws of motion. So, the first one obviously if you recall uh, the first law states that if you have a body which is at rest or uh, it is in motion then the body will try to continue that state unless uh, you apply a force and then compel the body to uh, just uh, change its state. So, that is the first uh, uh, law. So, what it says a body remains at rest or in motion in a straight line with constant speed. unless force um, is applied to change the state. So, that is the first law. Second law which is really interesting and we are going to use this uh, second law. What it states that uh, the body which is undergoing some uh, change of momentum, then um, rate of change of momentum is equal to the is equal to the net force applied. Now, with that uh, let us go back to the first uh, law once more that if you have a body then we have to apply a force actually to change its state. The moment we apply a force to change its states what will happen it will uh, change the momentum and the rate of change of momentum is actually the force that we are going to apply. So, if you have a force then obviously this force is equal to as per definition rate of change of momentum. So, with respect to time the momentum of the body changes and then that rate of change of momentum is actually the force applied. Now, what is this momentum? You know this is mass times the velocity. Now, how do you define velocity? V, it is nothing but the first derivative of the displacement which may be s in uh, these case. So, limit delta t tends to 0. So, the displacement say s at time t plus delta t minus s at time t divided by delta t. So, that is the 
velocity and now again uh, what we have here uh, we can put that expression uh, of momentum then obviously in place of momentum we replace that with uh, the expression of momentum and then obviously the mass is constant. So, what we have here is mass times the rate of change of velocity. Now, this part you know what it is called this is called the acceleration that the body is going to experience. So, this is nothing but mass times acceleration. So, what we have here force that we apply is effectively mass times acceleration. So, that is uh, what we get from Newton's second law. Now, if we look at this expression, what we have here, this is nothing but second derivative of d s d t 2 and then uh, you can also write in terms of velocity. So, this is nothing but limit delta t tends to 0 velocity at t plus delta t minus velocity at t divided by delta t. Obviously, what we get acceleration is nothing but second derivative of the displacement with respect to time. So, what we can sense is uh, from this second law that we have uh, the force applied on a body and that is actually related to the acceleration that the body is going to experience. Now, we will see how we can extend this further and then we can use this information and then uh, for a structural vibration problem, we can develop the equation of motion. We will see how uh, the D L M Bert's principle is derived from this concept and then uh, how it is extended further to develop the equation of motion. Now, effectively what we have, so if we have say a body, say this is the body which is say over a plane and for the time being say this is frictionless for the time being, uh, there can be friction also. But for the time being, if we consider uh, that there are forces say F1 and then say another force F2 and then because of these two forces acting at this point, the body moves in the this direction obviously with an acceleration. So, that is the force which is equated to the resultant. Obviously, uh, this F2 what you can see uh, on your screen, then you can resolve this force into two orthogonal components and when we write down the equation as per Newton's second law. So, we consider some uh, coordinate system. So, this is x and this is say y and then summation of all forces acting in the x direction is equal to m times say a and uh, to be more precise let us write a x. So, this is a x that is the acceleration along x direction. So, that gives us some idea how to correlate the applied forces with the acceleration that is the body is going to experience. Now, uh, let us first talk about the third principle and then we will take up some examples. So, the third principle says that if we have say two different bodies, so and they are connected 
then one body is actually applying a force on another body and <coughs> they are in equilibrium then obviously the second body will apply a force which is having the same magnitude but opposite direction and that is how these two forces from two different bodies will uh, maintain the equilibrium. So, what it says that uh, every action has an equal sorry. So, third principle says every action has an equal and opposite reaction. That is how this action and reaction they have the same magnitude and that is how they balance each other to maintain the equilibrium. So, for the time being let us focus on the second law. So, let us consider an example. So, we have a body which is acting over a frictionless surface. So, what we have here is the body here. <coughs> Say the weight or mass of this body is 25 kg, we can convert it into weight and if we apply a force which is equal to 100 Newton. So, our task is to find out because of these forces, what are the forces? Obviously, the one we apply uh, over this body and then obviously, uh, mass times acceleration will be the force that will balance and from that our task is to find out acceleration. So, what we have as per Newton's law, we have only one direction which is the horizontal direction. So, sum of all forces in the horizontal direction is actually equal to mass times acceleration in the horizontal direction. Now, obviously, what we have here is 100 Newton that force is balanced by this 25 times a h. So, a h in this case will be 100 divided by 25. So, it is 4 meter per second square. So, you can easily correlate the applied force to the acceleration uh, that the body is going to experience. So, let us take a different example. So, what we have here is example 2. And in this example, we have a body over an inclined surface. So, you can see this body and in this case, we have friction. So, the weight of this body is acting downward so that's the weight w which is equal to mass times gravitational acceleration and then obviously we can resolve this into two components, one perpendicular to the surface and one along the surface. So, if this angle is theta, then obviously the w will also make an angle theta with uh, two components. So, this one will be w cos theta and the other one is w sin theta. Now, you can see whenever this uh, component w cos theta is actually applied over the surface at this point, obviously that will generate uh, 
reaction. So, we will have that is the reaction say N and then in this case we have friction. So, at the surface there will be friction. So, mu k that is the coefficient of friction and obviously this multiplied by n is the force acting. So, the body tries to actually move in this direction. So, we have to apply a force in this direction and then it also experiences because of this uh, there will be a motion. Uh, just one minute I will uh, come to that uh, part. So, these are all the forces acting on the body. Now, <coughs> this diagram what we have is what we call free body diagram. So, the full form is free body diagram. What we do here? We actually identify the body and all the component of forces acting on the body. So, once we have the free body diagram, let us uh, draw the axis. So, in this case we have uh, one along the plane and another perpendicular to the plane. So, we have x and y axis and because we apply a force P, obviously there will be some acceleration in this direction. So, we have mass times the acceleration along x. Now, we identify all the forces and then obviously, once we identify all the forces, uh, we can apply the second law. So, there are two coordinates, one along x, another along y. So, uh, we will apply second law along. So, f x will be equal to mass times a x. So, this is along x and we will also apply the same law along y. Now, let us first focus on x direction. So, what we have here? What are the forces? We have P and then we have another force W sin theta in the negative direction. So, we have W sin theta. Then obviously, in the same direction we have the frictional force and that is equal to mass times acceleration A x. Similarly, in the y direction also we can identify. So, what are the forces? We have n in the positive direction, then minus w cos theta and this is equal to m times a y, but if you note a y equal to 0. So, obviously, the right hand side will be 0 in this case. So, along x we have the first equation. So, along y we have the second equation. Now, from this second equation what we get n is equal to w which is equal to mass times gravitational acceleration times cos theta. Now, once we do that we can further substitute the expression of n and then we can quantify what is the force required that is P required to maintain an acceleration of A x. So, let us see what we have P minus m g sin theta then minus mu k m g cos theta is equal to mass times A x. So, what we get P is equal to m g then sin theta plus
plus mu k cos theta plus mass times acceleration. We can also write down the acceleration A x in terms of the applied forces. So, it will be P minus m g within bracket sin theta plus mu k cos theta divided by m. So, you can see we can correlate the applied force and the acceleration that the body is going to experience. Now, what we will do? We will solve one more example and then we will extend this uh, logic and we will see how D. L. Lambert's principle brings in the concept of dynamic equilibrium and it helps us to develop the equation of motion. So, that we will do in a minute. So, let us solve one more example and in this case, so example 3. So, in this case, we have a pendulum. So, a bob is hanged using a string and then with time it changes its direction and then from the vertical position it comes to the new position with an angle of uh, theta. The difference between this problem and the previous one is that in the previous case the motion was rectilinear and then here it is curvilinear. So, we will see what is the difference. Now, if you have uh, this uh, pendulum then in that case also we can identify the forces. So, first uh, first component weight is acting downward. So, that is say m g and then again it will have two components. So, we can identify the two components. m g cos theta and then m g sin theta and this component m g cos theta will be balanced by a tension that is T in the cord or string whatever you call it. Then uh, the body will experience actually two components of acceleration one along tangential direction and one along the string. Now, obviously, the force along the tangential direction is mass times the acceleration along tangential direction and obviously, the other component will be mass times normal direction uh, the acceleration in uh, along the string. In this case again we have two coordinate systems. So, this is the x and obviously in this direction we have y. Now, for this problem again uh, we have the free body diagram and then what we can do is uh, we can apply Newton's uh, second law, then along the x direction we can identify all the forces and that will be equated by the mass times acceleration along that direction. Now, if we identify the forces along x, what we have? We have minus m g sin theta minus simply because as per our sign convention x is positive as marked on your screen you can see and this m g sin theta acts in the opposite direction. So, this will be equal to mass times a t. 
obviously from this expression what we can see a t will be equal to minus g sin theta. What it indicates? Negative means the direction we have considered it is in the opposite to that um, direction that we have considered. Now, if we write down the same uh, principle along y direction, so what we have all forces along y times, I mean this is equal to mass times a n, right. And then um, what are the forces acting at that direction? So, T that is the tension in the string minus m g cos theta is equal to mass times a n. So, what is a n? This is nothing but 1 by m T minus m g cos theta. Then once we find out a t that is the acceleration in the tangential direction and a n that is acceleration in the normal direction, we can find out the resultant acceleration. Right. Now, this clearly shows us even in case of rectilinear motion uh, of a simple pendulum, how we can apply Newton's second law and correlate the forces with the acceleration that the body is going to experience. The only difference in these cases is because the motion is curvilinear uh, as compared to rectilinear motions where we had only one component of acceleration, in this case we have two components, one along tangential direction, another along uh, normal direction. Now, with that background of Newton's law, what all of you have learned in our physics course, let us see how uh, D Alembert extended this and then uh, defined the dynamic equilibrium. So, D Alembert's principle. It was proposed by John Leron D. Lambert and then as per this principle, if we have say a body and again in this case, we have a system of forces acting on this body, then we can actually find out the resultant of all these forces say F1, F2, F3 all these forces and we can find out uh, what is the resultant of all these forces. Then uh, we consider this as a system. Okay. Then the moment we apply a set of forces, obviously what will happen? This set of forces F1, F2, F3 in these case, there can be many other forces, then it will try to change the state. And to maintain the dynamic equilibrium, what we have to do? We have to apply a force which he called this is inertia force to maintain the dynamic equilibrium. So, Recall the third law, it says these two forces must be equal in magnitude opposite in direction. So, D. Lambert says that sum of forces acting on a system, so we can find out what is the net force minus the inertia force. So, what is the inertia force? It is nothing but mass times acceleration, so minus m a is equal to 0. 
So, that is the D. L. Lambert's principle which comes from the Newton's second law and he introduced this um, concept of dynamic equilibrium. Now, if we consider an example, so what we have in this case again a body and then it is over a surface where the friction is there. We apply a force which is at an angle of theta with the horizontal direction. So, this is theta and then uh, this body has some weight. So, that is the mass times gravitational acceleration. Now, what we will do? We will first identify the system of forces and then uh, we will use this D. L. Lambert's principle to develop the equation of motion. So, in this case again we have two uh, sets of axis one along horizontal direction that is our x axis and then another vertical direction that is y axis. Now, because of friction, so there will be a frictional force. So, what will be that? It is mu k that is the frictional coefficient times n that is the vertical force. So, there will be a vertical uh, force n along positive y and then all these forces will cause change in momentum. So, in the horizontal direction we have mass times a x and in the vertical direction we have mass times a y. What we can easily conclude that a y is equal to 0. So, let us see how we can uh, apply D. L. Lambert's principle. So, in the horizontal direction we have summation of all forces minus the inertia force that is mass times acceleration A x is equal to 0. So, what are the forces acting in the horizontal direction? Obviously, this uh, externally applied force will have a component P cos theta and in the vertical direction again we will have another component P sin theta. So, what we have P cos theta acting along positive x then minus mu k times n minus mass times acceleration is equal to 0. So, that is the first equation. Then we can also apply the same principle in the y direction. So, in the y direction all forces in the y direction will be balanced by the inertia force m a y equal to 0. Obviously, in this case because a y equal to 0 what we have is uh, n minus m g that is the weight and a component of the force p p sin theta. So, these are the forces then inertia along y mass times a y is 0. So, all this is equal to 0. So, this is the second equation. So, what we get is uh, n is equal to we have m g minus p sin theta. And then once we get the expression for the vertical force n, then we can 
put it here. So, p cos theta minus mu k in place of n what we have m g then minus p sin theta and minus mass times a x is equal to 0. Then what we get from this expression what is a x is 1 by m and then we have p cos theta from here and then minus minus plus. So, we will have plus mu sin theta mu k then minus here there will be a k mu k times m g. So, that is the expression for acceleration. Now, this example clearly shows you that how we can apply D L M Bert's principle to maintain the dynamic equilibrium. So, what we do in principle we identify all the forces along the reference axis and then we identify the inertia forces then sum of all the forces which offers us the net force that will be balanced by the inertia force along a particular direction. So, for a system of forces we first identify the coordinate system and then we resolve all the forces identify the inertia forces all of them together gives us the free body diagram and once we have the free body diagram we apply the equilibrium along the reference axis and then uh, with the help of that we find out the acceleration that the body is going to experience because of the set of forces acting on the body. So, that is uh, the D L Lambert's principle and uh, we will see in a minute how we can extend this as we progress also in this course we will see we will apply this same logic to develop the um, equation of motion before we solve them to find out the response of a system when we have um, dynamic force and change of inertia. Now, before we do that uh, let us first define what we call degrees of freedom. So, in this case again so Let us first define degrees of freedom. In short form, we call it DOF. Now, for that, let us first consider uh, example. So, we have again a pendulum, then let us consider the reference axis. So, along horizontal direction we have x and then in the vertical direction downward let us consider y. Now, obviously, it moves to a new position along this path. Then at this point, what is the coordinate? x i and y i. So, once we define the orthogonal coordinate system x and y then the new position can be described by this coordinate x i and y i. So, apparently there are two coordinates x i and y i to define the deformed shape of this body. Now, in case of this pendulum, it has a bob as you can see which is hanged by a string of length L. Now, the assumption if we have that this uh, string does not change its length, it is inextendable, then obviously in the new configuration the length L remains constant and therefore, 
uh, if we mark this angle, then what we can do? We can apply coordinate geometry and then what we can see is that x i square plus y i square is equal to L square and then x i is equal to L sin theta and then y i is equal to L cos theta. What it tells that the moment we assume that this length does not change and the chord is inextendable, obviously we can develop a relation between x i and y i. So, in that case what we need? We actually need theta only one parameter to define the deformed shape. Therefore, in this case theta is sufficient to actually describe the deformed shape and hence we call it a degree of freedom. So, in this case how many degrees of freedom we have? We have only 1 degrees of freedom. Y 1 again I repeat although apparently x i and y i are the two coordinates components of the coordinate actually along x and y uh, which is required to define the deformed shape, but because of the property we have the assumption we make that this chord does not change its length, then we can correlate these two x i and y i and therefore, only one uh, parameter in this case it is theta. So, one variable this is enough. So, to define the deformed shape and hence we call it uh, degrees of freedom which is 1 in this case. Now, obviously, if the length does not remain constant, we cannot develop this equation and in that case, uh, how many degrees of freedom we will have? We'll, we need both x i and y i and therefore, in that case, we will have 2 degrees of freedom. So, what is the definition of the degrees of freedom? It is the it is the number of independent coordinate system required to define the deformed shape of a body. As we progress, we will see how we are going to use this to actually first identify the degrees of freedom for a system and then uh, we develop the equation of motion. So, if we consider an example, say we have a portal frame because in structural engineering very often we use portal frame. So, if you have a portal frame, then and just imagine there is an earthquake in the horizontal direction only for the time being, then what will happen? This portal frame which is a combination of two columns, these two columns having horizontal stiffness k, they support a mass at the top which is defined by m. Now, what will happen? If we have a support which is vibrating, obviously it will try to deform in the horizontal direction. So, it will deform. So, that way it will deform in the horizontal direction. Obviously, it will once go in the positive x and then next time it can go in the other side negative x. So, that is how the body is going to vibrate 
when we have this say earthquake. Now, in this case, obviously, if we consider one coordinate system along horizontal direction. So, if we have say x of t, then one coordinate system is sufficient to describe the deformed shape and in this case again it has 1 degrees of freedom. If I modify this structure slightly, so what we do, we add one more story. So, what we do? We have one and then there is another story here. So, this is also a portal frame, but in this case we have two stories. So, the first one say m 1 and the second story has a mass of m 2 and then column k 1 and then k 2. Then in that case at every floor level we need to define the deformation. So, at the first floor level, so we have x 1 of t and then at the second uh, mass we need x 2 of t. So, in this case how many uh, independent coordinate systems we need x 1 and x 2. So, what is the degrees of freedom in this case? It is 2. So, 2 degrees of freedom. Now, in this case we have only single bay, we can have multiple bays also and multiple stories, but whenever we have such a system, for example, if I have a pendulum here and then we add one more string and attach one more bob. In this case, obviously, we have to define theta 1 and theta 2 to define the deformed shape. So, how many degrees of freedom again in this case we have? We have 2 degrees of freedom. So, we can identify the number of independent coordinate system, it is important. Then that number will define the degrees of freedom and once we identify the degrees of freedom, then what we can do? We can apply D. Lambert's principle to develop the equation of motion. As we progress, we will see how we can do that uh, in the next week. First thing we will do, we will uh, apply this uh, D. Lambert's principle for a single story, single bay portal frame and then we will derive the equation of motion. So, with that let us conclude here today, we will continue our discussion on um, uh, other type of motion, we will consider simple harmonic motion in the next class and we will see how we can uh, derive the equations representing a simple harmonic motion. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.